you're watching on video or if you come up with questions after the presentation, um, feel free to send me email. I'm always willing to talk to members of the community about building stuff that I helped build, right? So it's always very exciting. So I want to talk, before we get really stupid started, super started here, I want to mention a couple of things about this term Windows Runtime. The way you typically hear the term WinRT, the acronym we use for Windows Runtime, is this definition. The new API surface area of Windows 8 that's available to C++, as well as JavaScript, C Sharp, and Visual Basic. You can see that in the now famous Windows 8 platform architecture slide that we showed off at build. Right there in the middle, WinRT APIs. Right? We're clearly talking about you know, the communication and data, the graphics and media, the devices and printing. All that is the stuff that ships in the box with Windows 8. And that's great. I love that definition of Windows runtime, but it's not really relevant for what we're talking about here today in my presentation. Because as external developers, you don't get the ability to put APIs in the box. Only Windows gets to do that. So that comes to the other definition of Windows runtime. The low-level system infrastructure that enables this language projection, right? And this is the definition that's relevant for my presentation today, right? Because you, as an external developer, can leverage this API infrastructure. And you can build your own APIs that project into the various languages that Microsoft supports, C++, JavaScript, C Sharp, and Visual Basic. Now, this isn't a big surprise, right? This is what we've always done. You could always build C-based APIs. You could always build COM objects. Sridhar just walked through how you can build static libs and dynamic link libraries. So the ability to build Windows runtime components as external developers is probably not a big surprise, but it's an important point to make because these components allow you to tap into that same cross-language interop story that Microsoft had as part of the original vision of Windows 8. When I joined the team three years ago, the documentation had a diagram that looked basically like this. Right? This was our goal. This was our objective from the beginning, to be able to build an API set that we could consume across languages. And not just consume, but consume in a way that we, talk, we talked about natural and familiar. You can use COM objects from C++. It's not what I would call a natural and familiar experience. Windows Runtime is designed to project in a natural and familiar way, regardless of which of these languages you're using. For example, we'll learn more about asynchronous operations later. But an asynchronous operation in JavaScript projects as a JavaScript promise. An asynchronous operation in a CLR language projects as an awaitable. And, JavaScript, and an asynchronous operation in C++ projects as a PPL task. As a C++ developer, we expect you to be most familiar with your own language constructs, in this case, PPL. So we've done the work to make sure that when you consume these Windows Runtime APIs, it feels as natural and familiar as humanly possible. We do a lot of these kind of transformations. You know, CLR will project an I vector as an I list. JavaScript automatically camel cases APIs because that's what JavaScript developers expect. This is a very powerful infrastructure, and we've done the work in Windows 8 to make sure you can leverage it for your own components as well. There's three different ways you can build Windows Runtime components in Windows 8. You can use C Sharp and Visual Basic. I realize this is a C++ conference, so we're not going to talk about that. You can use the C++ CX language. Herb talked about it some this morning. I'm going to be talking about it more later today, uh, as part of my presentation. That's what we're going to talk about today. And we'll see Sridhar back later this afternoon to talk about using the Windows Runtime language, a variant of ATL that we authored and we developed for the construction of our internal APIs that you can also use for building your external APIs using the vanilla C++11 rather than using the C++ CX variant. We have a bunch of reasons why you might want to use C++ uh, to build your Windows Runtime components. Of course, the first is performance. Herb likes to talk a lot about the great performance of C++, and he's absolutely correct about it. If you want to be able to build the most high-performing applications, C++ is often considered the best way to go, especially if you want to use some of those new 
cross processor, not cross processor, um, AMP extensions to be able to smear your work across not only the CPUs but the GPUs on the device. The flip side to performance is battery efficiency. A lot of these devices that Windows 8 is going to run on are these small footprint ARM style devices where battery life is very, very important. Windows runtime, I mean, uh, C++ being as efficient as it, as it is, not only improves performance, but also improves battery efficiency. A third reason is decompilation protection, right? Anybody who's used any .NET language is probably very familiar with Reflector, the reverse engineering tool that automatically can take any managed assembly and reverse engineer it back to the C Sharp or VB that originally created it. There are obfuscation tools that make it harder, but they're not very commonly used. And JavaScript, while there are minification tools, you actually ship the source code to your JavaScript in your app onto the client machine. So if you're concerned about protecting your intellectual property, compiling it into a C++ component is the best way to protect it. If you want to access Win32, Sridhar was mentioning about the fact that there's the Win32 API that's available to desktop, which we're all familiar with, and we've had it as part of Windows forever. And then there's a subset of that API that's available to Metro-style applications. Now, we have wrapped a lot of stuff, and we've exposed a lot of APIs in Windows 8 via Windows Runtime, but not all of them. We have a demo that we'll talk about a little bit later where we're using X-Audio. My teammate Jason Olson built this great audio application where he's using X-Audio. X-Audio, not exposed via Windows Runtime. So, if you want to consume that from your JavaScript or C Sharp application, well, you can't do it at all with JavaScript. There's no interop story for JavaScript other than Windows Runtime. And if you want to do it with CLR, you've got to go do p invoke and com interop black magic. That is part of the reason we invented Windows Runtime, so you wouldn't have to do that anymore. Of course, the final reason is existing code, and Sridhar spent a lot of time talking about that in the last presentation, so I'm not going to go over that any further. There are three primary scenarios in which you will build what we like to refer to internally as a hybrid app, an application that you build using multiple language technologies. Right? You, of course, you can feel free to build an application purely in C++. You don't have to go down this route. Right? But you can build an application where all of your front end is using web technologies, HTML and JavaScript, but then you're building your back end code in C++. You can build your application using C Sharp or Visual Basic on the front end and build your back-end components in C++. You can also do the inverse. You can build your front-end in C++, and then use C Sharp or Visual Basic on your back-end. Right? You could totally imagine seeing that for XAML controls. Right? There are a lot of existing controls that have been built on the XAML platform on .NET. Now you can access those on C++ with a small amount of porting work. Asterisk. You can imagine being able to build a C++ application and leverage these existing XAML controls that have been ported over after they've been ported over to Windows 8. Now, we're talking about C++ components here, so we're not talking about that third scenario as part of my presentation. We're primarily talking about building C++ components. So, instead of going through a whole bunch of slides, I figured it would be easier just to write some code. Does that work for you guys, or do you want to see more slides? More code, okay, good. Very, 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 uh, let's try to get you guys a little bit more excited about this. Okay, so I'm just going to fire up Visual Studio. And uh, I've got an application here. I've got two components, things. I've got the Windows Camp sample, which is my back end component in C, and I have my Windows Camp sample app written in uh, CLR, uh, written in C. Sharp. I've done this ahead of time so that you don't have to see my mad design skills with you know button and text box and there's a hidden image on this page too right i realize that that this we'll, we'll have a minute of silence for the massively stunning uh design work that harry i'm a type system guy i don't do any design work at all so and i've got a component here right and i'm going to use c plus plus cx and i'm just going to go off and i'm going to build something very simple i'm going to start with hello world we've got a much we got much more interesting stuff coming up but you always start with hello world so i'm going to write string right I've, you'll notice up here, let me, um, I just realized I forgot to increase the size of my font here. Let's do that. Sorry about that. You guys can read that, right? Okay. So you'll notice that I've included a bunch of namespaces up here. Platform is the namespace for the C++ CX stuff 
uh, that isn't co that's coming from the C++ team that helps do your Windows runtime interop. These other namespaces that start with Windows, Windows Foundation and Windows Storage Streams, these are, these are namespaces that come directly out of the Windows platform. Right? And we're going to use these later in the demo. So I just figured it'd be easier to have them set up ahead of time. So I'm going to do a hello world type of operation. So I'm going to start by creating a string. I'm going to use the little hat because this is C++ CX. And I'm going to write a function called, say, hello. And to make it a little bit in more interesting than uh, hello world, I'm going to take in a value as a name. And so now I'm going to return. And I'm going to call into the string class. And it inclu includes a concat function. And I'm going to say, I'm going to in, concatenate two strings, ref new string, hello there, space. And then I'm going to put in the name. All right, so this is an extremely simple. I'm just taking in the string that's passed in, prepending hello there, and returning it. This is not brain surgery by any stretch of the imagination. So now I'm going to go over to my, job, my, C plus, my CLR code. And I'm going to increase the fonts on this too. So I've gotten I've wired up a button click event for that button. And so I want to say var windows component uh, windows camp sample equals new windows camp well the namespace isn't there. It's cuz I haven't added the object as a reference, right? So let's go do that now. So I'm going to go into the references dialog box. If you've ever worked with CLR, I realize this is a C++ conference, but maybe you've worked with CLR too. It's, this is the new uh, add reference dialog in Windows in, uh, develop, in Dev 11. And there's an option here for solution. And I can just pick Windows Camp Sample and add it to my project, just like I would add any other managed assembly to a managed project. And now when I go in here, you'll notice that I've got Windows Camp Sample showing up on my IntelliSense. Right? So then I'm going to say WinRT component. That's just the default name that the template provided, and I didn't bother to change it. And so now I'm going to say, my text equals WCS dot, oop, I got to compile. That's right. Got to compile real quick to make sure that the metadata is pre-populated so we can drive the IntelliSense experience. Oops. Aha, uh -huh. forgot to make this Unicode. Sorry about that. And I used the lowercase l. Sorry about that. OK, that's good. So now I can come back over here and I can say WCS dot say hello. And I'll say Herb Sutter, because he's standing in the back of the room. And I'll say my text dot, yeah, dot text equals this, right? And I'm just going to deploy this app. And I hit this, and you can barely see it, I'm sure, because it's cut off. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, but it says up here at the top, Hello there, Herb Sutter. That's a very boring sample, but it was a good place to start. So let's do something a little bit more interesting than that. I went out on CodePlex looking for sample C++ code. Sardar just talked about the ability to use existing C++ code in your project. And I found an image processing library. Now, Windows includes a bunch of great image processing libraries as part of the default install. There's a bunch of these APIs for doing image processing. But the image processing library that I found online had this really cool function where you could generate a plasma image. Right? So you just give it a width and a height and some random information, and it will automatically generate this plasma image for you. So that's the reason why I have the hidden plasma screen, uh, the hidden plasma image on my slide, is I want to be able to call into that API. So let's go off and do that. That's a much more complicated solution project than this. So it's going to return an I random access stream. right? This is a type in Windows Runtime, which is why we have the little hat, that represents, a, again, a random access stream, a buffer in memory or on the file system. And I'm going to call this get plasma uh, image. And I'm going to pass it two values. I'm going to pass it an unsigned int. Oops. Width and unsigned int height. Now, the thing here is that is this operation takes some time. And Windows Runtime is very, very, uh, is a very strong believer in asynchronous operations. In order to have a great, fast, and fluid experience for your customers, for your users, 
You want to make as many operations, any operation that you think is going to take a long time, you should make it asynchronous. In Windows Runtime, you say that by saying I async operation. And this is what is in Windows Foundation. Uh, let me uh, make this full screen here for a second. OK? So what this says now is I've got a function called get plasma image. I'm going to pass it in two integers, unsigned integers. And you'll notice I'm just using unsigned int, just like you would in any other kind of normal C++ code. And I'm returning an iAsync inf operation that returns an iRandom access stream. OK? Now, we're going to be really good C++ developers, and we're going to put this code in the code behind, as opposed to, or in the, in the CPP file. So I don't want to put that much code into my header file. And because I don't think you want to watch me type, I've got a bunch of this code already written that I'm going to copy and paste in a little bit at a time. And let me fix the font again. OK, so the first thing we have to do is, well, I'm going to cheat a little bit. I didn't have time to do the standard C++ iOS library to Windows Runtime Stream library interaction. I didn't have a chance to do that conversion. So I'm going to cheat a little bit. I'm going to write this image out to the file system, and then I'm going to open it back up and read it back in so that my C# -sharp component could, uh, can access it. I totally could imagine building this, rebuilding this in the future so that I'm just doing all of this work in memory so that I don't ever have to touch the file system. But I also had to have something that I was ready to show you today, so I took a shortcut. So the first thing I need to do is I need to have a place to write this uh, file. And it turns out that one of the APIs in Windows uh, is this application data API. This is an API that you can use to store data that's relevant to your application. There's three different places you can store data, local, remote, and temp. Right? Local data is stored on the local system and is kept forever. Uh, remote data automatically synchronizes using the Windows Live account so that any machine that the user logs into with his Windows Live account will automatically pull down the settings. And finally, temp, which is like local in that it's local on the system, does not get replicated, but also gets cleared out periodically. Since I'm using this for this sort of temporary folder, I'm going to use, since I'm only doing this for this temporary purposes, I'm going to write to the temporary folder. So I'm going to go off and I'm going to get, it's a static property. The current is a static property off of custom application data. And then I'm going to use that to retrieve the temporary folder. I'm going to save that in a local variable because it turns out I'm going to need it later in the code. Now, I can go in and retrieve the full path of this temporary directory. And I can use, get it at its low level. Uh, it's the, you know, basically a pointer to the character array by calling the data method. And I'm going to drop this into a standard Windows, uh, a standard STL string, W string. And then I'm going to convert it using this kind of hacky trick into a standard string. And I'm doing that because the code library I'm using expects 8-bit uh, characters instead of 16-bit characters. Another change you might want to make to the system would be to, you know, to make this, uh, the library that I'm using uh, build a version of it that knew how to talk about Unicode characters. But again, I didn't have the time for that for this sample. And I wanted to be able to demonstrate using this essentially without any changes to the library whatsoever. So then I'm just going to append you know, a file name, plasma.bmp. So now I'm going to pull in the, the, the code to actually call into that plasma that, call that plasma function. There is no C++ CX. There is no Windows runtime. There is no Windows specific code in this at all. This is just a library that I pulled off the internet. I'm creating an image. You'll notice I'm passing in the width and the height. I'm setting a bunch of parameters that I literally have no idea because I copied and pasted this out of the sample code that comes with the library. And I called Plasma, and I'm saving it to the path. Now, clearly, this library is not Windows runtime specific, so it's using standard C library APIs to write this image out to the file system. Right? And those are part of that standard Metro API surface area that we make available to all Metro style applications. Shadar talked about this a little bit in the last session. Right? So I didn't have to go over and convert all of this stuff to use Windows runtime file APIs or Windows runtime stream APIs. 
right? You could imagine making the performance better because I'm not going to go out and hit the file system, and then my next piece of code, next piece of code is just going to read that stuff back in from the file system. Might have been better to do this in memory, but again, I had to do this in a very small amount of time, so I didn't get a chance to write that code. And as I said, I copied and pasted this directly out of some sample code that ships with the library that I picked. Um, so then finally, I'm going to, now that I have this file written out to the file system, I'm now going to load it back in. Now, all of the file APIs, because they're going out to disk, take potentially a long time. And so all of these APIs are asynchronous. So they all are written using these I async operation functions. I async operation is the standard representation of any kind of asynchronous operation in the Windows runtime. And we've done work in each of the language projections to make consuming these APIs, these asynchronous APIs, as natural and familiar as possible. We'll see that a little bit when we get to the, the, the calling this API here in a minute. In C++, that means we're using PPL tasks. Right? So if we go up to the top, you'll notice I've got you know, foundation. These are sort of normal. We saw these before. Using namespace concurrency, include PPL tasks. There's a whole talk on PPL tasks coming up, so I don't want to get into too much detail about this. But basically what I'm doing is I'm calling the get file async. Right? You'll notice that I kept around the temp folder uh, object for a reason. I'm going to call get file async, which gets me a file with the name, in this case, plasma.bmp. I take that task, and I'm going to pass it to a function called create async. Create async is a standard is a function that is included in PPL tasks that will convert a standard C++ task into an iAsync operation. So you can do all of your work using tasks, and then at the very last second, before you ship it off to the language projections, wrap that in a call to create async. So you'll see here that I'm taking the I I call you know, this function get file async returns an i random access stream. Uh, I'm sorry, get file async returns a storage file. You'll see that's here. But my task is returning an i random access stream because that's what's returned from open async. So all I'm doing here is I'm asynchronously getting the file and then I'm asynchronously opening the file. Right? So it's this sort of dual operation uh, get and then open. But I'm wrapping it in a task and then I'm wrapping that task in an i async operation so I can call it from the outside. I'm going to compile so that I can get this in my IntelliSense, like we did before. And now I'm going to go off, and I'm actually going to copy and paste this code in as well, because it's, I want to make sure that we don't mess anything up. No. OK. So, so now here we are calling that same function, calling that code, right? So if I call. There you'll notice there's my get plasma image. It shows up in IntelliSense. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to call get plasma image. But because I'm using C, C sharp now, instead of doing a task-based operation, I can use await. So I'm going to just await this. And so instead of getting this back as an I, I async operation of random access stream, I just get this back. If you can see it, it's maybe a little small with the IntelliSense as a random access stream. And then I can just go off and use it. I create a bitmap image. I set its source to the stream, and then I set the my image, image control in my XAML to use this bitmap. So I will fire this up. And if the demo gods are nice to me, I will push the button, and we will get an image. So this is an image that I generated in C++ and then passed back to CLR for use in a CLR application. Okay, so. I also want to show you a little bit of JavaScript code interoperating with C++. So I'm going to show you a sample application that was written by a teammate of mine named Jason Olson. Jason is a musician, which is very cool unless you have the office next door to him because he's always got music playing. And you're trying to work. No, he actually uses his earphones. He's a great guy. And so he wrote this very cool application, which is essentially a drum sequencer, which you may or may not be able to hear depending on how we get them, if it'll pick up on the microphone. So hold on a second. So. Can you guys hear that? Maybe not. I'm not sure where the speaker is on this thing, frankly. Okay, well, not very exciting to hear it like that, but you can see here, right? I'm using my touch screen here that I can 
set up different patterns. You can see that it's operating. You, maybe you can't hear it, but is there a, you have a microphone that I can use for a second? I am. That's on this side. Uh, I forgot about this with you guys. I'm sorry. Here, I got it. No, I guess it's on this side. Any luck? No, it's definitely the out. Sorry, I forgot to, I forgot about this. I do have it turned all the way up. Okay, it's not that big a deal. So, no, no worries. It's my musical stylings match my design skills, so it's not really what we're here to see. So, let's take a look at this code though. He's built two separate libraries, and he's built two separate pieces. The drums app is all in JavaScript. So if we look in here, we'll see there's default HTML, right? Divs, tags, image tags, all that kind of stuff. Here's his JavaScript code, right? Very exciting. And then he's built a component in Windows Runtime using C++ CX uh, that he's got uh, called the drum C drum sequencer. So in this case, he's defined, he's defined, oh, let me uh, set the fonts, sorry about that. So he's defining a lot more interesting types than I was using in my little sample app. He's defining an enumeration, right? He's defining a delegate, because he has to be able to provide a mechanism to allow the code, the C++ code, to inform the JavaScript code that the metronome has ticked. And that's, if you see in the application, there's a little red bar that goes across every time and it's to keep the UI and synchronized with the audio. And so that's how he's doing that is with this event. So then he's defining a ref class. It's implementing an interface called tick handler. And he's implemented a bunch of these functions, start, stop, set note, set drum sample, all of the decision about what drum samples are hitting is all driven by the UI. And then he's got this event, ticked event handler. And then he's got a bunch of privates. And you'll notice that you know, one of the rules about Windows Runtime is the public surface area of your type has to conform to the Windows Runtime. So you can't use task, right? You can't use shared putter. You can't use any of those things in the public surface area of your type. But you can totally use it internally. So you'll notice here that he's got this in, he's got an audio engine, he's got a metronome, and he's just using standard C++ CX uh, pointers to control the lifetime of these in the whole no-delete fashion, so you don't have to think about the memory management of these things. If we look at the code for Dream Sequencer, we're not going to go through all of this, because I'm running out of time, and I'm, I think we've got a panel coming up and lunch, so we want to make sure we get to all that. So, He's basically able to call into, he sets all this stuff up. So here he is calling into his drum sequencer. He sets up the metronome. He sets up all the drum, letter, uh, uh, drum levels and that type of stuff. When he starts the player, he starts the metronome. And the metronome, if you look in the on tick, right? So this basically is how the system, the metronome object, because he's factored his metronome code separate from the drum sequencer, it's notifying the drum sequencer that we've hit a tick, right? This happens every second, or I forget the specific uh, um, uh, accuracy of his timer. But he goes off and he plays these drum sounds. And in fact, if you look at the audio engine, you'll notice that he's using X audio, right? So this is one of those Win32 APIs that's in the box, but isn't projected using Windows Runtime. So JavaScript has no ability to call into that directly. But he's built a C++ component that wraps access to that so that he can call into it from JavaScript. If we looked at the engine, you'd be able to see the code for that. I'm not going to do that here. The last thing I want to show you is this. with this is that he then fires an event. right? And what he's doing here is he's capturing the current window because it's very important, and this is one of the tips and tricks I'm going to talk about here in a minute, that you fire the events from the thread where they were registered on. Users register for events typically on their UI threads, so you have to fire them on the UI thread. So what he's doing here is he's capturing the current window, and then he's setting a callback, and then he's using an object called the dispatcher to invoke that callback 
on the correct thread. If you've ever worked with XAML before, or if you're doing any XAML work for Windows 8, the dispatcher object is a very standard object. It's used to be able to execute operations on the UI thread, even when they're coming from a background thread. So with that, I'm going to go back to slides. So I want to do a couple of quick uh, tips and tricks, and then we're going to uh, finish this up uh, and go into the panel discussion. So the first thing to remember is that, C++, uh, that Windows runtime is a marshalling boundary. Depending on the language interop uh, scenario, there is significant copying going on, right? If you've ever worked with JavaScript, a JavaScript array doesn't look like anything like what a C++ array looks like. A JavaScript array is an object where the, the properties happen to be numbers. So you can do things like delete four. So now you have an array with 0, 1, 2, five, 3, 5, right? As a C++ developer, that doesn't make any sense. But as you can imagine, because we project arrays as JavaScript arrays, there's a significant copy that goes across when you do that processing boundary. So you need to think about that when you're designing your Windows runtime APIs. So here's two example pieces of code that look like they're doing the same thing. The top one is using an array. The bottom one is using a collection class called iVector, or iVectorView, because it's a read-only vector in this case. These, co these look like they're doing basically the same thing. It's almost identical code. They're both for loops. The only thing that's different here is the marshalling. The top sample copies that array in one entire fell swoop for execution. In the vector sample at the bottom, every time you call get at, it's going across that boundary and going back to the original object, which is the right way to do it. It totally depends on your scenario. If you're passing a whole bunch of bitmap buffer information to the back end to do processing, you probably want to pass it as an array. But if you want to pass an object where you're going to have random access and the client and the, uh, the code you're passing it to may or may not be able to access, need to access all of it, you probably want to use a vector. I talked about async a lot, right? We provide only async operations for things that we think are going to be long running. And you should be doing the same in your APIs, right? We, we saw an async operation one, so I'm going to skip over this one because I want to get through here to the panel discussion. The last tip and trick I want to leave you with is this one around UI updates. We saw this one in the code as well. You want to go off and use the core dispatcher to make sure you're firing events on the right thread, especially when you start working with C++, because C++ allows you to do some great things in order to spread your work across multiple threads. Right? That's part of the benefit of things like AMP and part of the benefit of things like the thread pool. Right? You can run these things on a variety of threads in order to be able to get the best performance and the best efficiency out of your code. But make sure when you go back to the UI thread that you're doing those executions on the correct thread. And that's what the core dispatcher is for. And we saw this code before, right? I'm going to get the, if I have the window, and I can get window by calling core window, call, uh, the static method get for current thread on core window, then the dispatcher hangs off it, and I call the invoke method, and I pass it a delegate. Again, that's another example of that whole natural and familiar. I'm just using a standard C++ 